from the game, I'd really like to make it out of this room alive and not die a horrible, painful death. I know, it's a temp time. <laughs> Welcome to this week's Character Unlock, where we're going to spend a little bit of time, I think, talking mostly about Resident Evil, because that's the only game really that's come out recently. And it, I do, I'm still sitting in the stain I left on my sofa from playing it the last couple of days. I am hosting, as always, I'm Andrew Brooker, and joining me is my good buddy, John Miller. Hello. And for the first time, uh, a, a fellow failed critic and a big-time retro gamer who has found his way across many and varied video game podcasts, Mr. Matt Lamborn. Hello, mate. Thanks for having us on, guys. Yes, really looking it's forward to pleasure. chatting some Resident Evil with you both. Yeah, it's going to be a going to be a good one, I think. Well, so th- for there's going to be, I think, a slight crossover. Maybe one person that doesn't know who you are. Do you want to do you want to tell us who you are, mate? Yeah. So I sort of got started doing podcasting with the Fell Critics team about three or four years ago and since then I've, I've kind of branched off into to other projects like you say I'm a bit of a retro gamer so I'm a member of the RGDS podcast that's the retro gaming discussion show um, I've previously been a host on Retro Asylum in the past and I've also done a podcast dedicated to FIFA Ultimate Team which is no longer going at the moment but we might do a new project sometime in the future on that but just happy sort of shooting the breeze with you guys about current and old games and yeah just good to chat with like-minded people from time to time yeah it's a it's I, I have to admit I, I think I said this a couple of times in previous podcasts I've when we started doing this I had no idea if it was going to be good if it was going to be shit no I was pretty sure it was going to be shit yeah but that's the one it I just the community the ga- gaming podcast community it's a really niche community but they are all of them are so cool so cool and it's so cool to chat to them as well I you know it's it's such a cool a set of people to be mixed with. I am well chuffed. I can't believe how well received actually we've been and how friendly everybody is considering how guff this could have turned out. Yeah, well, it helps you both quite likeable chaps and you know your stuff. But uh, yeah, the gaming community is quite tight knit and for the most part it does what it can to support each other. It's not terribly cutthroat or anything like that. So providing that uh, you're not too controversial. Don't say anything bad about Nintendo. Uh, you'll probably get along just fine. Don't say anything bad about Nintendo. Right. I think I'm that, doing that, that is, one. That is the key to success. Well, is it just like, don't talk bad about old Nintendo? Because new Nintendo, I, I have bad things to say about. For, for my experience, I'm not backwards about going forwards when it comes to laying out critique about anything. And I consider myself a massive Nintendo fan of the past, and I personally don't like what they're doing anymore. But a lot of people who listen to these tough podcasts, they still got a boner for Nintendo. So if you come in with criticism, you've got to back it up very, very thoroughly, or else they'll crucify yeah. you. But um, oh, yeah. you, you're dealing with people's childhoods here, not just what's going on right now. So it's like the girl that you liked when you were 15. You can't say anything bad about her now she's 35 or 45. Uh, her nose might be falling off and her makeup's not so good, but just, yeah, now she's a, just, now just she's be a polite. she's a minger, but you're not allowed to say that. Exactly. <laughs> well, okay, so let's uh, let's let's do a, a little bit of news because plenty. Well, there's plenty. There's a few things to talk about, I suppose. The biggest one, the big news, the last week or so. Square Enix and Marvel, <coughs> excuse me, Square Enix and Marvel are now collaborating to make uh, what seems to be a series of Avengers games. Now, the the news out of out of Square Enix uh, last week, I think it was Friday, it was announced, is that Crystal Dynamics, the guys that are making or that make Tomb Raider, uh, will be making an Avengers branded game. And the room going around at the moment, and this was kind of solidified with. Edos saying that, or Idos, sorry, saying that they're going to put Deus Ex on hold for a bit. It, the rumor is that Idos are going to be making a Guardians of the Galaxy themed game. What do we, uh, what do we think to that? 
Well, personally, I'm going to go with the fact that uh, I love Deus Ex, and yeah, the potential for them to make a Guardians of the Galaxy game is high for me. Cool. Matt? Yeah, I think the potential there is, is pretty enormous because, particularly with Guardians of the, the Galaxy, because it was lean quite heavily towards the kind of sci-fi angle that they've been doing with stuff like the, the more recent Deus Ex games. Uh, so the, the change over there isn't going to be too drastic, but um, the people who've been playing games for a while will be familiar with Square Enix's partnership with Disney for a game called Kingdom Hearts, Yeah, if you remember that one. So there is precedence here for this type of thing, and they did it spectacularly spectacularly well it's such a beloved game and they could almost deliver a steaming pile of turd and this will be guaranteed to make money given the popularity of the mcu uh, particularly guardians, uh, guardians of the galaxy even if it's picking on the back of the sci-fi uh, love towards star wars rebirth as it currently stands so it's hard to see how this won't succeed whether it will be quality is another thing um but Square Enix very rarely put a foot wrong with this kind of thing, and they're going to have so much time and money invested in it that uh, I would be surprised if it didn't deliver on all fronts. Do we think it maybe uh, it goes up against or works with the the Guardians game that Telltale were putting together? Hmm. Well, <laughs> different different type of games entirely, aren't they? I mean, I don't personally consider Telltale. Like proper video games, they're more no kind fuck of like, no, they're they're point and click games. Yeah, they're they're kind of like pro- projected stories and yeah. fun nonetheless, and and beautiful a lot of the time. It's not really the same thing. So I think the two can coexist, and there can be a dedicated audience for either or both. You can enjoy both of them. I don't see why there would be too much conflict there or cannibal cannibalization and sales or anything like that. Um, two very distinct audiences, but they they might cross over. Who knows? Yeah, cool. And the, what about the Avengers side of it? Do we uh, would we would we all play an Avengers Tomb Raider based style game? Uh, <laughs> or, or a game that looks like Tomb Raider that is actually the Avengers? I probably should have said that a bit better. Yeah, it's, I'm trying to to visualize it in my head. It's it's quite difficult. Tomb Raider. It's not my style of game. I don't like these these kind of quick time event driven, um, overly beautiful looking games that don't give you enough sort of independence of movement if you like um, yeah. so Tomb Raider doesn't do it for me but cinematic it, games yeah you know stuff like that and Uncharted don't do it for me even yeah. though they are quite universally lauded as, as excellent games no doubt they're absolutely beautiful so if you're going to stick the Avengers into the Tomb Raider engine you're only going to get good things out of it aesthetically it's up to them to try and make it a compelling uh, game yeah. Um, I don't know if you can remember way back when there was a PC game called City of Heroes, which was a very early, massively online RPG. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Very popular back in the day, and not too many people have taken a stab at the superhero genre um, at large. Maybe now is the time the technology is right to do something with that again. So given that this it's guaranteed success given the popularity of the license they're going to be using if they pour all their resources into it, I think it could end up quite good. Cool. I'm mentally playing the opening scene to the the recent Tomb Raider reboot as the Incredible Hulk. So I think that works quite funnily. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th- I mean, I think you're right. But there's, I think Square will put some effort in, or will put a lot of effort in. Uh, Crystal and, and Idos will both put effort into what they're doing. His, I hope they don't go like you said, it's Marvel, it'll sell, and fuck it, that'll do. Because that would really suck. Because there could be a lot of people excited for this. Yeah, yeah I think it's it's going to fly off the shelves quicker than hotcakes, proverbially speaking. But yeah, it'll yeah. be a massive success, whether it's good or not, I think. It's possibly a good move for Square, because although they've not released a bad game in a long time, apart from Final Fantasy, their games don't sell particularly massive amounts even though they are pretty spectacular? I think their games sell all right, I, I, without looking at numbers. I think their games sell okay. I think the problem Square have is they put far too much emphasis on sales and always, always say they're going to sell 4 million more than they actually do. It doesn't mean they sell badly. It means they just don't hit the what they want. But, yeah, I mean, any Marvel game, any game with Marvel on its title is going to be, like Matt said, it'll fly off the shelves. 
there'll be there'll be no stopping them. I think once that comes out, or once they come out, but it's early days yet. But literally, all we have is a teaser with no information on. So I think we've got yeah. a little way to go. The pre-hype has begun. Yeah, as it always does. This is after this is a thing that's really starting to bug me about the games and films as well because. I'm sick of seeing teaser trailers for teaser trailers for films too. But this is really starting to annoy me seeing, you know, having games. I mean, it's always been the way, but having games announced and, and have the hype start in a year, two years before a game's due out. This, The Last of Us 2, we got this big hype building trailer and literally they, the guys came out and went, we well, yeah, so don't know when it's coming out. It's, we've only just started making it, but have a trailer. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So, now I've got two, three years of hyping this game up in my head for it to never, ever meet the expectations I build for it in that time. Bastards. Well, we, we saw in our last episode what exactly happens when you hype a game up from a la- as a launch title, for instance, and then it gets cancelled. Yep. So, here's... Yeah, I hope it does all right. I'll, I'll play it. Of course I will. But I hope it's not crap. I hope they do a good job. Other news. There's one... Of the, well, there are two other bits I want to... What we want to talk about but the first one actually and this came out last week as well I don't know if you guys saw or are even interested but Prey was given a release date last week did you guys come across this? the Prey remake huh? Mm, the Prey remake that's not really a remake <laughs> it's just, just given the name Prey because reasons uh, I mean are you guys interested in Prey? If you, you, know, you, do you know anything about Prey? And it kind of passed me by the first time round but as I understand, it's one of these games that it didn't accomplish what it perhaps should have done in regards to sales, but it kind of has a, a sort of rabid fan base. So they're trying to do something with a ready-made fan base that's going to back it hardcore and then try and attach a new audience to it, which you know is absolutely fine. Lots of licenses have done that before. Um, they just have to deliver uh, quite solidly this time if it's something that people are kind of vaguely aware was good but never quite dabbled into sort of mass market extent um, yeah. so I'll be interested to see what's going on there but I uh, need to do a bit more search on Prey before I make any uh, long term predictions on that one so I would I would bank on a bit closer to the time when trailers start appearing you know TV spots and things I would bet that outside of Bethesda's name being all over it I would bet that it's it's sold on from the makers of Dishonored, I guarantee it, because you've got an instant fan base. When you look at Prey, if you look at any of the videos for Prey, it's basically Dead Space. If the guys from Dishonored made it, that sounds pretty good to me. Well, yeah, it sounds fucking great to me. I'm a massive Dishonored fan, and I'm I'm quite happy to play because the the trailer they released last week actually creeped the hell out of me. It was a very creepy trailer, and it looks to be a good. It looks like Dead Space. It looks like it's going to be a decent sci-fi horror. I'm you know. I'm absolutely up for that. So yeah, I but I would bank on, you know, from the makers of Dishonored all over the, the proper public marketing for it. You'll get a lot of people just from that. Because Dishonored's got a big name for, you know, it's two games in and both criti- critically acclaimed. I think, you know, that will get an audience in. But yeah, that comes out in May. 5th of May, that's due out. Mm, so, it's on the cry engine, that, so it's going to look it's gonna look the bollocks. And just while you've been talking about it, I just pulled up the wiki. And Mick Gordon's composing the soundtrack. You know, the mm-hmm. guy who did Doom amongst other things. So, yeah. guaranteed to be absolutely incredibly sounding, which will tie in very intricately into the gameplay. So, yeah, I'll be definitely checking that out. I didn't realise it was on the Cry Engine, I have to admit, because uh, Arcane have just modded id Tech for the latest Dishonored. So, I didn't realise they were using Cry Engine for, for Prey. But it will look oh. good. Yeah, one way or the other, it's going to look the, yeah. the business. Yeah, I mean, we've all seen the new id tech with Doom, and it looks fucking amazing. And you know, Cry Engine will always look good. But yeah, fifth of May, I'm looking forward to that. That's a that's a day one buy for me, I think. And a day one ignore from me. <laughs> <laughs> you and your anti Bethesda. I'm just going to leave you for one episode one day, just to leave you to rant about Bethesda for an hour and a half. I think I could manage it. I'm pretty sure you could. <laughs> uh, and finally, kind of, you know, I say, I say kind of, it's not kind of at all. It is actually genuinely sad news. Is uh, 
the the man that founded Namco, and I'm so glad you're here for this, Matt, because you are absolutely the expert in this more, much more than I am. So he he founded Namco, didn't he? This man. Yeah, we're referring to Masaya Nakamura, um, the founding member of Namco. He's died at 91 years of age, so he's given us probably the best part of 40 years worth of solid entertainment and gaming experiences and appears to have had a very good and long life, which is fantastic, unfortunately. Another Japanese gaming hero or grandfather of the industry has departed us, which is very sad. Um, just we to, we're getting to that age, though, aren't we? You know, you and yeah. me especially, we're getting to that age with the people that we, you know, whose games we were playing when we were kids. You know. Yeah, I mean, we went through the whole many celebrity deaths of 2016 thing, which was a bit cringy. Obviously, it's nothing to do with 2016. It's just that we're getting to a stage in life now where a lot of the heroes or people who had influence on the things that we like when we were children are now hitting a certain degree of life maturity. And if they're not dying now, they're going to be dying in the non too distant future. So we're going to go getting beaten from pillar to post with with sadness about deaths of people we've never met or known other than (laughs) the, the experiences they've given us through video games. And they do stick with you because you've either experienced them fairly recently and enjoyed them or they were part of your childhood, which would definitely be the case for most gamers in in the term of Namco. For instance, you can go right back to the absolute genesis of video gaming and and Namco were amongst the games like Galaxian, uh, Pac-Man, Galaga, Pole Position, all stuff that most retro gamers would have spent hours and hours and many 10p coins um, (laughs) misusing their childhood and even if you're of a slightly younger uh, age bracket, let's say like John, I'm sure he would have been around for the induction of the original PlayStation which was heavily backed by Namco. I mean, a lot of people put it down to its sort of pop culture marketing uh, and the clever way it was uh, sold to sort of teenagers and ravers and that kind of thing, young adults. But it was very heavily backed by the top arcade games of the time um, by Namco, stuff like Tekken and Ridge Racer, uh, Starblade, amongst other ones. Um, Without that, there wouldn't have been the real 3D clout to push the PlayStation as as it was from day one, we would have had to wait until much further down the line before we saw the absolute capabilities of that system. Namco made it a must-have from day one, and some of my favourite gaming experiences have come from Namco. Um, so very sad that uh, Nakamura-san has departed, but he leaves us with lots of memories and a lot of cool games to talk about. So, what were your favourite Namco games whilst we're on the subject? Uh, John, do you want to go first, mate? Uh, all right, I'll jump on and I'll go with the Soul Calibur stuff. There it's you like, go. Yeah, it's not wrong with Soul Calibur. Nothing like wrong with Soul Calibur at all. Tekken with weapons. Yeah. <laughs> I, admit, I I go quite a bit further back. And I don't think, actually, because I think this game came out like late 80s, so I would have been like 7 or 8 when it came out. Uh, I played it much later in one of the many shitty older arcades from, from where I lived. But Splatterhouse. Yeah, the perfect Halloween game. But it's Friday the 13th, the game, without actually saying Friday the 13th on it. Yeah, you know. a love letter to great 80s horror movies, perfectly executed both in the arcade and most of the home conversions of it. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent choice. You can't go wrong with that. No, what about you then, Matt? Um, my most profound Namco game experience would be Tekken, um, the original one. Um, probably a game that hasn't aged quite as well as say other 3D fighters like Virtua Fighter or at least some of its sequels the original one's a bit pants but um, when I saw the Playstation for the first time in late 94 this was before it came out in the UK um, I was given a couple of games to sort by my mate who had one on import from Japan to sort of demonstrate it he had Ridge Racer which was amazing he had uh, Battle Arena to Shinden, which, as far as you first look at a 3D fight, it was kind of cool, but in the long run, it, it kind of sucked. And then he put on Tekken, and as I I want to do nothing but play this game. It looked incredible. The animation was insane. The gameplay was tight and technical. Um, everything about it just screamed by me. It was a system pusher, you know, a, a system seller. The 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 key app 
that the PlayStation needed to sell yeah. itself at the time. Um, you know, Neo Geo had been doing it for a few years, whereby you could own the arcade and the home, but at a ridiculously high price. The PlayStation version of Tekken was so close to the arcade that you were owning it in your home for a very affordable price. You know, kind of expensive as brand new hardware goes, but in terms of having an arcade in your home, very, very cheap. And it's had a, a long-lasting legacy. It's had an enormous influence on 3D beat-em-ups. Um, I just absolutely love it and would happily go back and play it or one of its sequels time and time again. So that was the most profound first time experience of playing a game I think I've ever had. Like the, the amount... People often say it's a cliche, oh, I played such a game and it blew my mind. I'm not going to say it blew my mind, but... I lusted for it so bad and at that <laughs> particular moment I wasn't buying um, import PlayStation stuff I had to wait for the power release so it was almost 12 months after my mate got it um, yeah. but I couldn't wait to, to go out and buy it and bring it home and yeah I had many many uh, glorious hours on, on that one and as John said Tekken kind of evolved into the Soul Edge series which led to Soul Calibur which is his favourite choice which is another marvellous game in its own right so the influence it's had on the genre and the competition that came through that with the Virtua Fighter series just as one take on, on 3D fighting games uh, really drove that particular part of the industry forward a lot so yeah um, as many great games as Namco have gone Tekken's the most profound experience I've had nice no I'm a big fan of Tekken and I still I, I've got a pretty decent collection of Tekken games kicking around I, I buy almost all of them even now you know I remember losing days and days and days to the first Tekken tag when it came out and me and my mates literally tagging in and out for hours on end you know and it's it's while it's always evolved it's always felt like Tekken when you've played it I'm yeah it's a good choice man it's a very good yeah. choice I'll just say as an honourable mention very quickly that my favourite arcade game ever is Time Crisis very good home version of the game on the Playstation but it, it loses a little bit without the pedal yeah and, and I, I don't think I ever played the Playstation version but I mean even even now like in, in Milton Keynes now and in Northampton where I spent a lot of my my teenage years I was Time Crisis machines, you could always find one, always. And I still can't help myself from putting a couple of quid in when I find one. Yeah, I absolutely love it. And something as simple as just adding that recoil mechanic to the gun um, just makes it so much more satisfying to play a light gun game. Because effectively, a light gun is a toy, and you do look yeah. like a bit of a chump using a light gun in an arcade ram full of people. But if you hear the clatter, they always the make recoil, the fucking pink one player one as well, the bastards. Oh, I don't mind a, I don't mind a pink G-Con, <laughs> that's absolutely fine. But it's the clatter of that recoil mechanic that makes it so much more authentic and legitimate and you don't feel like so much of a chump when you're playing it no. in front of a bunch of people. So, yeah, Time Crisis as an arcade game goes is absolute perfection. Uh, at home, it was, it was Tekken all the way. Nice. So, so for this week's what we've been playing I've actually I've not played anything I obviously you know, Resident Evil came out last week and I've done nothing but play that in like short 20 minute bursts but so I haven't actually got anything to talk about this week for, for what we've been playing so I will I'll go over to to John and Matt and let these guys talk about what they've been playing John mate what have you been playing this week? So, in big anticipation of Mass Effect Andromeda's release in a couple of weeks, I've been blasting my way through the Mass Effect trilogy. So, uh, I already had a, a, a relatively far through save. I was at Ilos in the, from the first one as I got that far. So I just I don't quickly, know what that means. I quickly finished <laughs> finished the game off. It's the the mission before the last mission, Brooklyn. Okay. Okay. God damn it! I just, don't just know fucking, what that means. <laughs> just fucking play. <laughs> Mass Effect. No, I'm not <laughs> fucking playing Mass Effect. Uh, sorry, go on. Anyway, so it's right at the end, basically. And I've uh, I've since moved on to playing Mass Effect 2. And for a game that's getting... It's about seven years old now. So it's, uh, it's, it's certainly reaching a point where you, you start to think, okay, maybe I should stop playing it. But no, it's, it still plays as well as it did for me and the fact that it's now on backwards compatible and not having to change the discs when I get to certain planets is certainly more entertaining 
from the from the original 360 version. But Makes life a little easier. Yeah, getting so getting around between the planets is easier. Uh, I'll be honest, I've actually managed to find some things that I'd never come across before, just because I paid a bit more attention to the uh, DLCs when they when I first played the DLCs. I'd already got maybe um, probably near two to three hundred hours worth of game time out of it by the time Overlord, at least, but definitely Shadow Broker had been launched. I didn't really pay much attention to the stuff going on in the background. Okay. And the number of in jokes in the the two DLCs, those two specifically, and to a lesser extent, Arrival, that I just didn't pick up on was quite quite funny. Well, that's good though, isn't it? Because I mean, for a guy that's played Mass Effect through, I mean, what you must be hitting fifteen hundred times. Yeah. You know, <laughs> for a guy that's played Mass Effect as much as you have to still be finding stuff. You know, as as much as I I, I take the piss and I say I'm not going to play it, surely. That's a good thing. If there's that much stuff in that game that, you know, a, a player like you can still find new things to do or new jokes or new anything in the game you've played that many times, that's that's got to speak volumes to to the development and the developers of the game. Yeah, I'm I'm going through conversation trees in almost a completely different way. I I learned recently when I was just reading a, a forum thread. Of someone mentioning a ways to play Mass Effect, and that I'd only just realised that I'm playing the game wrong this entire time, in that I'm making decisions based on whether or not I'm going to be on, on what I know the outcome's going to be, instead of basing my decisions on the character. Instead of letting that I'm the playing. game play out. Yeah. Okay. So I was going through thinking, oh, I know how this happens because I've played it so many times before. So if I make this choice, then I get to see this outcome instead. Whereas at the moment, I'm playing as um, Renegade Shepard, and I've done some things that I wouldn't normally have done because it doesn't get me a be- a better options. Fair enough. So so for that one, Rex is currently dead, which I've never... Um, I, I, okay. And, and play, <laughs> I'm playing as, as male... Shepherd and I've killed off Ashley because despite being a renegade uh, I don't like the way she's being incredibly racist. Fair enough. Yeah, that's the character that I'm playing is a, an anti-racist angry man. Jeremy Corbyn then. Yes, yeah. <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn in space. Jeremy Corbyn in space. And I've quite mm-hmm. a few people that would like to put him there. <laughs> so when's Andromeda out? Andromeda is out uh, March 23rd in this country, or the 20th if you're in the North Americans. Mm, so hold on, let me figure this out. So, <laughs> trying to figure out what we're doing. So, you'll have one, two, three, four, five days between that coming out and our next podcast. It's all right, I've got that booked off. And uh, I have access to it from the 16th, thanks to EA Access, and getting 10 hours. So about enough time. About enough to, time to just get his hair right. To, to finish, yeah, to to finish applying his makeup. Cool. I see. Because I keep saying we're going to do a Mass Effect special, and I keep forgetting to write it down. So seeing as I'm currently looking at my calendar, I'm going to write it in my calendar. So yeah, so so that'll be yeah. March we'll do uh, a Mass Effect special. We'll probably drag Brian back for that. I'm pretty sure Brian wants to come on and, and chat to you about Mass Effect. So we'll do that. Yeah, uh, Matt. What have you been playing this week, mate? That isn't Resident Evil. Yeah, I've had a, a bit of a busy weekend on top of Resident Evil. Um, I've been playing um, the Weekend League on FIFA Ultimate Team, which is my self-inflicted harm that I put myself through each and every weekend. So for people who don't play FIFA Ultimate Team, the premise is this. Um, you play tournaments during the week, which is Monday to Thursday. You have to win four matches in a row, and you then qualify for the weekend league. And the point of the weekend league, it's it's FIFA Ultimate Team's main competitive mode, where you'll be playing the best of the best, i.e., the sweatiest of the sweatiest players. <laughs> um, the the glitch abusing, cheesiest, nastiest ways of playing FIFA to the point where it becomes almost no fun whatsoever. But the rewards for playing it in game and in real life are quite significant. So even though I think secretly everybody hates it, we're compelled to play it every week. And the weekend league consists of 40 matches. 
Now you, it's optional. 40. You don't have, yeah, you don't have to play 40, but you can play up to 40. And yeah. the more games that you play and win, the better the, the rewards you get. Now you can imagine that takes an awful a lot of time to do, even when things are going very well. So imagine when you're having a rage-induced ship run form. Pads have been broken many times. Um, so, I mean, I, I know this might be a really stupid question, but I'm, I don't play FIFA like ever. Uh-huh. Yeah. Do FIFA Ultimate Team matches still last 90 minutes? Not no. 90 no. minutes in real time. They take about 20 minutes or so to complete. Oh, okay, that's all right. Because I was going to say, fucking hell, that's an awful lot of football. That, that, for... would, that would be one hell of a commitment if you had to play in real I, time. <laughs> this is what I was going to say. I mean, there's <laughs> there's self-harm and there's self-harm and fucking hell. Yeah. But yeah. Everyone would probably leave around about the 20 minute mark because they probably conceived about the 15th goal. Fair enough. Sorry, right. Matt, carry on. So, yeah, so this is something that I put myself through each and every weekend, and, and typically I, I give up at about the halfway mark. I get myself to a certain tier of rewards and then think, okay, that'll do, because if I play the next 20-odd matches, I'm just going to get really pissed off even if I do well. And it's very, it's very all-consuming, though, because um, your pride fucks with you a little bit when you don't do as well as you do or you haven't put as much time in as you would have liked and achieved as much as you could have done. It's very clever how they've they've done this EA. And it is, I think, an addiction for most FIFA players. I think um, the week before last weekend, the weekend league got cancelled because EA discovered people were able to glitch results. So, like, start a game up, quit out of it and receive a win, and the opponent get a lot, even though nothing had actually happened. Um, So when that happened and people were able to maximise the rewards they were getting from it and basically fake a massive winning record, they closed it for a week while they patched it. And everyone on Twitter was delighted. Like, oh my God, my weekend back is amazing. And it's just like, (laughs) why did we fucking play it? We are hopelessly addicted, unfortunately. And, And I think this is part of the problem now with modern online gaming is it's, it's almost not for fun anymore. It's, super competitive to the point whereby it's all about pride and the kudos you get for being better than a certain group of other players. Because Lord knows it's not that much fun. It's not like playing against random opponents and normal FIFA online matches. The calibre of opponent you're going to play most of the time is so strong and they're tactically so good that you're having to fuck each other over constantly. There's very few matches where you're going to think, oh, I really enjoyed that even if I won or lost. So, yeah, a little, a little strange psychological quandary going on there for myself and a lot of people who play uh, the FIFA Weekend League on Ultimate Team. But yeah, I played 30 matches and got myself into the gold tier, which means I get to skip the qualification for next week. So I'm, I'm in next weekend's Weekend League. I don't nice. have to do qualification for it and I get some chunky rewards, which is great. But it's almost like I find myself playing the weekend league or qualifying for the weekend league almost all the time that seems to be like most of my gaming time at the moment yeah it's a, te- it's a terrible cycle of self-destruction that all FIFA players are going through currently it, so it does seem like a lot of uh it seems like the same kind of thing that i i mean a lot of people do it, but i used to have it when i was in uh, a clan for kill zone right. it's it's not just you can't just get on and enjoy your multiplayer game you get shitty messages if you didn't I swear to God, this happened to me. I got a shitty message because I didn't turn up for training. Yeah, fuck you. People take their <laughs> online gaming very seriously, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But when you recognise that it's not good for you, and this is something I used to cover on our FIFA podcast, um, it got to a point where we were reporting so many negative things about the game. So I was like, you know what? We should just stop doing this podcast because we don't have anything good to say about it anymore. Yeah. And whilst FIFA at its core is a good game. It's fundamentally flawed in lots of different ways. And then this weekend league is, is poisonous because everyone wants the massive rewards that they can pack, you know, the most improved players and stuff like that. But the amount of free time you have to sacrifice to do it is absolutely absurd. But I'm sure I'll be doing it again this weekend. <laughs> Lo and behold me. <laughs> wow. No, I, I, I mean, I, I, think, I think Madden runs a similar kind of thing, but I don't. I don't play it. I I play Ultimate Team on occasion, maybe for two or three months after the game comes out, and and that's it. I don't bother playing in the tournaments they run because it takes up too much time. But yeah, fucking hell, that's that's a lot of effort. Yeah, it's it's dark days, and 
the, the way that they construct these games is, is so clever because it kind of makes you make a decision. You don't have time to play lots of games. You either play us or you don't play us. You can't yeah. play us and lots of different other things. And most people just end up playing FIFA all year. And I'm guilty of playing it way too much than I should, but I do like to play lots of other things. You know, I do play a lot of new games. I play a lot of retro games. So I'm not like 100% sucked into FIFA but it does take up far too much of my free time yeah oh, fair enough yeah I've qualified for one weekend league and it was actually a weekend where I wasn't even home for that weekend so Ooh. I qualified and then couldn't play in the actual weekend league and I've not qualified since well I dare I say you dodged tried many there, other man. times <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not easy to qualify once you are qualified it just gets very very difficult so yeah you, you did well to miss that one whether you meant to or not even when playing against my friends and even when I play against my friends specifically who's not very good at FIFA and I've, I beat more times than not I don't think I've managed to win four games in a row against him so winning four games in a row is actually proves quite difficult sometimes well, if it you need to do be. that I'll install FIFA myself <laughs> I'll never beat you I yeah, won't even true. pick up the controller I wouldn't even try. <laughs> I'll just turn it on and join you, mate, and there you go. It'd probably be more difficult for me to beat the computer with you not playing with the controller than it would be for me to probably beat you holding the controller and trying. I, although, saying that, if I, I suppose if I tried to beat you, I'd just make a complete ass of myself. So, I'll do that for you, mate. There you go. Problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody been playing anything else, or, or should we should we move on? I think we can move on. I think we can move on. Plenty of gaming goodness. Yeah, so uh, so let's talk a little bit about Resident Evil Seven. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so Resident Evil Seven came out. Was it Tuesday? It came out. It did. Yeah. Yep. So a week a week ago today, of time of recording, uh, and has been more or less. Widely hailed as an excellent, excellent game. Uh, before we get into talking about Resident Evil Seven, should we should we talk? Uh, uh, I mean, we've all got history with Resident Evil. I I know this, but have we all played all of the games? Or I haven't played six. Um, I played all the sort of main entries into the series. I haven't played like Gun Survivors and Revelations and stuff like that. Okay, but I play like one, two, three, four. Code Veronica, that kind of thing, and uh, loved all of them passionately. Um, I had five, hated it. Um, it became sort of too sort of militarized and drifted too far away from the original premise of the series to the point where I saw the advert for six and just knew it wasn't for me. And the reviews and overwhelming opinion of the gaming public kind of agreed with that sentiment. So I've never played six. I've no, no. intention of playing six. As far as I'm concerned, it's. I, on the I think same you and level. me have very similar, a very similar history of Resident Evil and Resident yeah. Evil Six. Yeah, it's kind of on the same level as something like Terminator Three. I just know I don't need to watch it because it won't ultimately make any difference to how I perceive the series as a whole. <laughs> what about you, John? Uh, I've played zero, and okay. I've played four, five, six, tiniest little tiny bit of seven. Uh, at Operation Raccoon City and part of First Revelations game. Okay. So you uh, never played the original? No. Wow. Well, you're, uh, you're in for a treat at some point. I should. I, I really should, especially considering I can pick it up. Well, right now, actually. Oh, our remake was free on. Yeah. Uh, on PlayStation Plus, I've, I've installed it on my PlayStation. I'm quite looking forward to, to jumping onto it, especially after finishing Seven, but. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I, I think I'm the same as you, Matt. I've, I've played all of them, up to and including five. I haven't played any of the Revelations. I played Operation Raccoon City, and the, 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 the less said about that, the better. No, wouldn't touch six. Just every trailer I saw, every review I read, just no, absolutely mm. not. So, what was your like jumping off point with with Resident Evil as a series? And did you play right from the first one? Yeah, I did. I bought my first my first PS1 I bought my PS1 just for Resident Evil it was a, uh, okay so I saw a friend of mine playing Resident Evil 1 and 
I was blown away. I really, really wanted to play this game. I just, I, I didn't have the money or I was busy doing other things. Uh, and then Resi 2 came out and I went, okay, I, I've got to stop fucking around here. Went out, bought PlayStation, bought Resi 1, I believe. By this point, the director's cut of Resi 1 was out, which is was the first one I played. So I bought Resi 1, the director's cut, and Resi 2 and played them back to back over the course of three or four days. Uh, and adored them. I absolutely adored them. I mean, one I liked, but thought it was a bit clunky, which seems really unfair because all games that came out in 1994 were clunky. But two, I adore two. Two is my favourite one. Two, it, it upped the horror a little bit with the biggest setting outside the house. I thought the house was great and and, and the house is, is its own character in Resident Evil. And this is something I think we'll talk about again when we start talking about Resident Evil 7 but when you got outside and you got into Raccoon City and you done a little bit of exploring and that, just that bigger area I thought was great and I loved Billy Birkin in 2 I thought was great I thought it was an yeah. amazing bad guy uh, probably I know a lot of people are big fans of Nemesis but I thought actually Billy Birkin was better than Nemesis I thought it was great I thought every time he evolved it scared the crap out of me uh, like I said, the horror was great. The music was outstanding. You know, the work, again, we'll talk about this later on as well, but the work with things like shadows and just going around corners, everything about Resident Evil 2 just scared the living daylights out of me, and I loved it for that. It's easily, easily my top Resident Evil game. Yeah, I think I'm in agreement with you on that one. I mean, I played the first one from day one when it came out. We had it on Japanese import. And a surprisingly easy game to play, on the Japanese format because all the voice acting was still in English. It had Japanese subtitles, but it made no difference. The only time it became an issue was, I don't know if you remember, there was a, a puzzle um, while, while she's still in the main mansion whereby you're having to hit different buttons on paintings and there's crows on the ceiling. Oh, if yeah. You hit the wrong one, the crows come and attack you. Yeah. Now, that requires the on-screen text to be able to complete <laughs> normally. Yeah. Um, so a lot of guesswork and a lot of writing shit down <laughs> had to go, <laughs> go into solving that puzzle in Japanese. But apart from that, it was like absolutely seamless. Yeah. And compared to the initial uh, PlayStation release before the director's cut, the Japanese version had more gore and, and more graphic cutscenes. Yeah. So it was the definitive debut version of Resident Evil. And of course, in Japan, the series is known as Biohazard. Um, which ties in with the naming of the, the new Resident Evil 7 game if people are wondering, well, why is it called Biohazard? Well, that's what the series is actually called and what I like to refer to it as. I, I, I that was going to be off. my next question is, are you a, a, a Biohazard kind of guy? Yeah, I'm not a snob about it because I think as far as the first game goes, the name Resident Evil is actually more befitting because yes. you're in one place and it's a horrible mansion full of scary shit. Um, but once you move beyond the first game, that name ceases to make any sense whatsoever because you've gone from a small, confined, horrible castle or mansion and you're out in the city, you're here, there and everywhere. The, the world becomes so much bigger, it's not resident anything. So <laughs> Biohazard always made much more sense after the first game. Yeah. Um, but I love how they reconnected that into the marketing for Resident Evil 7 and likewise in Japan it's called Biohazard Resident, Resident Evil. Evil so yeah. they we finally acknowledged the two and they have met after so many games where they've ignored each other at least in name they are now back at square one <laughs> and I think that's a, a great sign for what they were trying to achieve in the offset of this it's like Resident Evil has grown way out of our control um, it's encompassing far too much and it's no longer an out and out horror game we've got to bring it back to its roots which they absolutely do in Resident Evil 7 we'll, we'll touch on that more when we get around to talking about it but yeah I think 2 was the high water mark of the series um, it really felt like my experience of playing Resident Evil 2 and I'll, I'll try and put this in, into terms that people can better understand from watching movies you remember when you're young and you're watching some sort of video nasty whether it's a horror or some sort of gory slasher yeah or whatever and you know you shouldn't be watching it felt naughty yeah that's what Resident Evil 2 felt like playing that as like a 14 15 year old kid yeah it was absolutely absurd it felt like it should be punched at people far older than, than I was at the time and it was really <laughs> exciting to sort of be part of it 
and um, just a great game in, in its own right and it carried on the progression of the the story of uh, the protagonists in the first game who were loosely connected to what's going on in the second game very nicely um, it starts to get a little bit more wacky as the series goes on from there with um, part three was kind of like a filler I yeah. think because um, they I think they originally wanted to do um, co-Veronica on on the older systems but couldn't pull it off so they had to sort of redo something and came up with uh, Resident Evil 3 with the whole nemesis angle which it's not the best Resident Evil but it's the most scary in terms of him constantly stalking you down yeah I I have the same sort of levels of fear of that game as I do with, with Resident Evil 7. It's it's a very traumatic gaming experience. <laughs> and I think a lot of people who have come into Resident Evil in latter years have part four as their sort of starting off point, and that's what they love. And I think as a game in general, it's absolutely superb. And it's the starting point of where the series starts to wander into different directions. Yeah, it, go, it gets like. quite goofy from four onwards, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an acceptable amount of goofiness in Fall. Oh, for uh, sure. De- dealing with you know, cults and chainsaw wielding <laughs> leather heads and all sorts of stuff like that. I mean, great game. Absolutely superb game. Yeah. And it was good on every every version of it that came out as well, which is the most important thing. Everyone got a great game and experience out of Fall. Um, but yeah, it was the beginning of the end for, for Resident Evil. And it had to go away a little bit to be reborn into what we've seen come out in the last seven days which is a true return to form as far as I'm concerned and one of the best series in gaming is back with a bang now and I'm really yeah. excited about it we, we've left John over in the corner being really really quiet I mean I have a good reason to why I've not played Resident <laughs> Evil 1 in that I was 6 when it came out well okay fair enough <laughs> so but, so what's your, what's your favourite Resident Evil then? strangely enough I'm actually going to say this and Cause everyone to you know press stop on the on the podcast. I'm going to say that Resident Evil Five is probably my favourite. Okay. Now, I mean, I'll let you have Resident Evil Five as your favourite, but you're going to have to tell me why. I <laughs> I honestly, it's because of the uh, the co-op section for, uh, for it. The fact that it's an entirely can be played entirely in co-op meant that it's that's the reason to why it's probably my favourite. And it wasn't until the, the re-release to current gen machines when it actually occurred to me that I did like it more than 4 because I'd always been the person who'd said that 4 was the was the best one of the Resident Evil series but clearly I'm wrong in that one as well well it's quite a common like Matt was saying it was the jumping off point for a lot of people for Resident Evil so it's quite common for a lot of people to say 4 was their favourite yeah you know and I, I think give it a couple of years I think we'll have similar conversations about the one that came out last week because it's the you know it, it's the first it's, it's almost a, a reboot if you like it, it's it's going to be the jumping off point for a lot of people uh, probably you know. the jumping off point for me because if they're going to keep going with this kind of intense uh, fear element I, <laughs> I I am the sissy girl and can't play scary games <laughs> is this this is why you like five isn't it because it's not actually scary no it's not all. scary it's just it's just a, a shooter with not zombies. It's basically... Now, amusingly, uh, I'm going to go back to uh, what a friend told me told me when I, when I first bought this into this other franchise, was that it was Resident Evil, but with swords, and that's Onimusha. Yeah. Ooh. So, nice game. for me, Resident Evil 4 onwards is like Onimusha with guns. Fair enough. With, that's I, okay. And I'll be honest... Because five isn't scary in the slightest, and the fact that I've going back to it on the current gen versions of it is that I can still remember pretty much everything, and I've gone yeah. through and I, I've I could I could walk through every level and point out and shoot out all of the uh, the stars emblems just yeah. just from memory. I thought it was uh, it was quite cool going through it with a friend, and I was very tempted to pick six back up again because of the exact same reason with the co-op on it. But yeah. I remember playing six, and six is not a great game. I'll, I'll admit to that one. It's the fact that it sacrificed story just so that it could have um, multiple stories at the same time, where it's one overall story, but you just play as various characters all at once. Yeah, 
but not even all at once. You you go you you complete the story as one side one one pairing, and then you move on to play the story again, and you get to meet those pairings at various points. But the thing that really fucked it, fucked me off with that was that you'd be playing it, and if you didn't change the settings, you would get to one of those crossover points, and you'd have to wait for it to synchronize with someone who was also at that crossover point with the other story playing it at the same time. And if they fucked up, then you had to restart it yourself. <laughs> Oof, my boy. Wow. That's some pretty god awful game design. Yeah, it was really irritating, especially when you got to, uh, you were doing one of the the Leon ones where you had to wait at that point for it to time out because if you got that far early enough the Leon one, you would never get someone to assist you on the for the other person because you had to finish the story with all three of the original stories to unlock the fourth secret one, which is to play as Ada Wong. Okay. And there are crossover points where you're playing along. If you're playing in the Leon section, you just sit there waiting for it to time out to go. We can't find anyone to play as Ada Wong. <laughs> because because there weren't that many people playing it and there weren't that many people who got that far through the game to realise I want to keep playing it so I can unlock Ada Wong fair enough So I, I, I can't imagine me ever picking up Resident Evil 6 to play just not ever we, we should add it to our list of games we should play together nope that, that list that's um, ever growing Brooke, that never actually happens Brooker has to be Ada Wong yes <laughs> For sure, but it sounds like from what you're saying there, John, that um, that six it kind of backs up my theory about the series as a whole as it progressed that it started introducing far too many characters. It's a bit like Game of Thrones; it kind of oversaturates the amount of people you're supposed to give a fuck about to the point where you, you, they're all kind of forgettable. Um, and that's uh, one of the successes of the new game is there's not that many characters in it. And it's a very set cast list. And you know about everyone in it quite early on, so you know who who you're fearful of, who you should be caring for, and who you need to watch out for. Um, it even started from like number two, it introduced a lot of extra characters. You had Claire, you had Leon, you had Ada Wong, and the list grows ev- with every sequel. Um, and I think that's a bit of a problem. It's a bit of a shame. Most of them are, are totally forgettable, which is a shame. Well, with six, you've got. The, the teams of Chris Redfield and some guy pretty much. You've got Leon Kennedy and some woman. Sherry Birkin and the illegitimate son of Albert Wesker. And then the Ada Wong and again, another some guy pretty much. It and just this does, is the does, doesn't that, work out at all. This is the problem that Resident Evil's got for me. Well, well not anymore, but what it did with 5 and what it sounds like 6. Resident Evil's supposed to be a horror game. You can't have a horror game in co-op. You can't jump scare two people at the same time. And the atmosphere just doesn't work when you get to shout obscenities at your mate the entire time. And I think this is the big problem I had with 5 when I played it. Is it just wasn't fucking scary. At all. And having random characters as your second character would just annoy the piss out of me. Yeah, I agree. To be honest. You need to, to strip it back and get back to the core elements that made it so popular in the first place but this is the unfortunate thing for John he's come in at a stage whereby this is all he knows and on the basis of well this is an okay shooter game I like it nothing wrong with that but if you if you start from the beginning and you understand where it came from and how important it was at the time and the sort of effect it had on gaming in general we haven't had anything like Resident Evil before Resident Evil the closest you had had was Alone in the Dark, it's not quite the same thing. No. It's a survival horror game of sorts, but when you add the, the sort of horror element with the resource management and then what's seen like very realistic gunplay at the time, certainly isn't now, but at the time it was absolutely incredible. Uh, and all steeped in a very deep horror perspective, a horror story with bad B-movie FMV scenes, which has made it even more authentic. I mean, if you haven't seen the full motion video cutscenes from the original Resident Evil, you need to go watch them on YouTube. They are appallingly bad, as is the voice acting in the whole game. Oh, the whole and thing the, is just... it. You can't play it now without cringing. Oh, I yeah. love it. I love it. It's, it is so bad that it's good. And 
I find the remakes harder to play, even though they look and play better. But, but I, it's like when they you have an anime and they change the dub and they yeah. release it years later, and it's just like it's not the same film anymore. It, it doesn't have those deep ingrained memories for me. So even when you play the remake, the acting still not great, and it does follow the same script. It's just better enough for it to get a pass which is good for people coming into the series for the first time but if you played it in 96 it won't seem right no, no it doesn't it's not, it's not hammy enough as it should be particularly <laughs> someone like like Barry Burton who's the most hilarious Jill sandwich eating motherfucker of all time <laughs> oh god so okay so before we talk about Resi 7 so, I mean when I was at school you had yeah, I think a lot of people had this in, in various degrees but like when I was at school it was you were allowed to be uh, a Nirvana fan or a Guns N' Roses fan or, you know you couldn't you weren't allowed to be both so where did, where did you stand on on uh, Silent Hill me yeah um, I like Silent Hill it's, it is great but I was a Resident Evil fan yeah. um, the thing with, with Silent Hill is it's it's just as scary as Resident Evil but much more disturbing it's much more psychological whereas oh, Resident yeah. Evil was more about the jump scares and the fe- the sense of being overwhelmed when you're in a room with more than one zombie or a dog bursting through the window Yeah. Um, Silent Hill is legitimately creepy for people who like being scared like shit your pants scared yeah. I find that game very difficult to sit through I had to, to play it in the last uh, 18 months or so we covered it on Retro Asylum once upon a time and uh, it's like, God knows how I played this as a kid. It's just absolutely... I think the older you get, the more you succumb to the, the horror elements in these type of games. You get a bit more sensitive to it. Whereas yeah. when you're younger, it's, oh, this is really cool. It's making me shit myself. I think especially um, with something like Silent Hill, which is like you say, it's a, it's a lot of psychological horror in, in Silent Hill. So and you look at it and you go, what the fuck was I doing playing this when I was 14? <laughs> Yeah, and often it's quite a lot of what you can't see that scares you. Inside. Yeah. You know, it's, whilst it's in the same genre, it's, it is quite different. And certainly not all, uh, anywhere near as much action. No. So for someone like John, who finds Resident Evil 7 too scary to play, you've got no chance with Silent Hill. <laughs> they absolutely <laughs> bob open. Did you ever play it's, Silent Hill, John? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a sissy girl. Don't play scary games. Yeah, <laughs> you, you wouldn't get on well with that game. No. <laughs> So I mean enough enough uh, beating about the bush. Let's let's talk about Resident Evil Seven because this game, I cannot believe how fucking good this game is. And you know, I'm just going to get that out there straight away. I cannot fucking believe how good that game is. Yeah, so he's put his phallus on the table. He slammed it down with authority. This Absolutely. game is brilliant. There, there it is. That's the the brook of verdict right there. You know, well the thing for me, right? And this is you know, I've said this a few times in the past. If I'm going to put 5, 10, 20 hours into a game, it's got to be good. I ain't got time to play shit games. I ain't got time to play good games. So if I'm going to play a game, it needs to be fucking good. And as much as I only really wanted to play this game in like half hour stints, because holy balls, it was scaring the shit out of me, I didn't want to stop playing. And it's been a long time since I've had a game do that to me. Yeah, I thought I was going to struggle. To, to finish this because like you I'm a bit more casual of a gamer than I used to be and um, find it difficult to find long periods of time where I can just sit down and block everything out around me I've got two cats and a wife and I'm watching TV so it's like how am I going to sit down and immerse myself in this game for long enough for it to take effect well that wasn't a problem no. <laughs> um, uh, I was pretty scared from the get go with this Um one thing is it it doesn't hold your hand too much but the introduction is quite you kind of escorted through it like with training wheels on yeah um, without spoiling anything the first let's say 30 minutes of the game is, is kind of doing most of the stuff for you with some minor interjection from the player but the scene it sets is so intense I was like I can't believe this is happening in a video game I'm not going to go into anything specific there because if you haven't played it I would kill the experience for you as a first time player uh, and you do need to experience it but yeah. the opening half hour of this game is off the chain I mean I've never experienced anything like this in a game ever and that includes 
Silent Hill games. This is fucked up. <laughs> like, seriously fucked up. <laughs> yeah. There, I mean, there is no other way to put it, really, is there? It is... I mean, the, the best way I can put this game, and I, I, I've seen a couple of people say it as well, but they've kind of said it in a disparaging way. I don't mean it in a disparaging way in the slightest. It's actually probably one of the highest compliments I could give it. And anybody that's listened to me chat films on Foul Critics would know that it's absolutely Rob Zombie's Resident Evil. It's I, I get where you're coming from with that. Entirely. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. For me, because yes. for me, it's 100% a compliment. I am a massive fan of Rob Zombie and his hillbilly horror. I would watch them all day, every day, if I could. And this is the thing with Resident Evil, is it feels like that. It, it's it's Resident Evil by way of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah, I mean, let, let's talk a little bit about initial reactions to this, because I was I very quickly started making comparisons about this game, because it's, it's very clearly influenced by Konami's PT demo, which you yes. can see the light of day. Um, you can definitely see that it's made Capcom rethink what they want Resident Evil to be and what the public is going to receive the best. And yeah. they went for that stripped down, 100% horror, creepy vibe, and they nailed it. So Konami get an assist for this, but unfortunately for, the, for them, they fucked up by not putting out PT, um, which is, of course, the the modern take on Silent Hill, the demo which didn't exist for very long in, in PlayStation Network and then was eventually pulled when the... Hideo Kojima started to anger his employers, but we won't go into that. But um, my immediate reaction is, and as it went along, it's it's a little bit The Hills Have Eyes, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Blair Witch Project. That might sound a little bit wishy-washy to put all three of them together, but at various points in the game, I think, this is just like that one, this is just like this one, and this bit's just like that one. It's like they've taken everything that's great about horror. Yep. And blended it into one perfect mix and then added a little bit of action. Not too much, but the action in it is oh so satisfying and a good array of sensible weaponry. Nothing too ridiculous and over the top that no. would take you out of the immersion. So hats we off. Even get, we even hats get on. a little bit of sore about halfway through as well, which yes, blew me do, away. Yeah. I, was, yes. I was stunned. I was like, this is, this is fucking amazing. I sat there giddy in my seat, watch other. This is fucking amazing. This is so good. Yeah, I did get quite stuck on that bit for a while though, so it did wind me up a little bit. And again, <laughs> we won't spoil it for people, but when no, you when you I guess you tackle... I'm guessing you'd done the same thing I did, which was go through all of the same things that you'd done when it was a video. Yes. And yeah. That, that doesn't go so well. Um, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, there are all these weird points in, in within the game whereby you collect videotapes, and this isn't spoiling anything too no. much for anybody, but it, it kind of builds storyline by showing you what's happened in the past, and that gives you clues on how to proceed. So people who have been through the horror before you have tried to negotiate the house and whatnot, and they've left evidence behind for you. And you can see how they failed and, and then try and get around it, but it's great at creating storyline, although it does sort of pad out the overall... Uh, longevity of the game quite a lot uh, by doing those so they are optional you don't have to do all of them um, but yeah the, the storytelling in the game is really good and then of course that leads you up to the Baker family which what a wonderful creation they are oh they <laughs> are brilliant fantastic characters they are every single one of them and again you know Hills Have Eyes Texas Chainsaw Massacre you know all in, you know they're inspired by all of those great great films and they were just amazing, and I, it, I sat there and I thought when I when I got past the first member of the family, or when I thought I got past the first member of the family, I, <clears throat> I listened. I, I was a little bit sad after. I was like, okay, we're not going to see. That's a, that's a bit guy. I could have could have done with more of him. But then you meet the rest of the family, and they're all equally as fucked up. Uh, I. Yeah, I didn't expect them, I have to admit, in a Resident Evil game. And I think this is half the genius of Resident Evil 7 is you go in, even though you've seen you've seen trailers, you've maybe played the demo, you, you, you know what Resident Evil is, you go in with a certain set of, of preconceptions before the game starts and then you meet the Baker family and they're blown out. All, all of the, every idea you think 
of what you're about to play is gone. And yeah, yeah, Jack's scary. Yeah, they're very well written and very well voice acted. Um, I can only imagine what they must be like in the Japanese version because this is a very American take on what Resident Evil is. Yeah. It's, it's almost an Americanization of the series. But I think it'll have a much broader appeal as a result. And I'm sure the Japanese market won't know what's hit them when they actually play this for the first time. It's it's absolutely insane. Um, I think the only person who isn't particularly well voice acted in this is is the character you play, Ethan. He's a little bit wishy-washy and sort of underreacts to a lot of very traumatic experiences in the game from my experience. He seems to very flatly go, what the fuck? Said, no, dude, you scream that loud and you turn around and you run away. <laughs> you can't be that unenthused about what's going on in front of you. No, I think you're right. He's not very well voiced at all. Yeah, but he's the, the exception that proves the rule that every other character in it, particularly uh, the members of the family, are insanely well written and, and brilliantly performed. So very much enjoyed that, that aspect of the game. And there's so many parts during the game that are, are going to provide shock. Um, and it's not just at certain stages, it's literally a a continuation you have jump scares you have a bit of psychological horror and then you have just all out grotesque because yeah. the, without again without spoiling things too much the members of the family that you encounter they undergo mutations as you would expect in any boss battle on resident evil and they are they range from strange to spectacular to all out disgusting uh, you'll feel every emotion possible when you, you're fighting against them. Um, <laughs> I, that's what the thing with this. It's such an up and down roller coaster. And when I first played it, Brooker, I couldn't decide whether I liked the game or not. Because, but I think I was just too scared. <laughs> I think no, I think you you've got it right. I, I was exactly the same. Even in the prologue, you go through like, oh Jesus, this is this is it. The atmosphere, the music, or the lack thereof music. And I think that's it's something again they brought they brought back from like the early Resident Evil games is just quiet and creaky house and you know literally scared to look around a corner and when you go around a corner and you know I saw it in gameplay stuff I saw it in trailers and the first time Jack appears even you know that early on I shat a brick I absolutely shat a brick and there's uh, a, a bit I think this is probably where John's stuck as well. You know, I need to go to the basement. I don't want to go to the basement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one thing I, I would tell people. You know, when you, you start the game and it asks you to sort out your screen settings and do your borders and stuff and then do the gamma correction. And it's like, if you can set your color down so you can barely see this logo and then you can't see the other one at all, no, ignore you. that, all, bump all the way it up. up two or three notches <laughs> So, so not all the way up, but quite a bit up, because if you do it to the extent that the game is instructing you to, maximum scare, but you will struggle to see a lot of shit. Yeah. And I would recommend not notching up the gamma two or three, just so you can actually see what's in the same room as you a lot of the time, because this is one of the, I'm not going to say it's a drawback, but it's one of the, the consequences of going to a first person view. You are more immersed, and you do have this, this slight tunnel vision thing going on, your peripheral vision, if the darkness is set, is so low yeah. that it's difficult to see enemies and items, but it will provide the maximum scare factor. To be but fair, it's, it's a trick I used for Outlast as well. Yeah, I'm a massive pussy. I needed more light. That's <laughs> all I'm going to say on the matter, to be honest. Yeah, I, I was very close to running into the game and treating it like, every, like the Resident Evil games that I played before. So five, six, four, where it's just go straight at it, you know, without care in the world. Nothing, nothing bad's gonna happen. And then I started seeing everyone mentioning how fucking batshit scary Resident Evil Seven was, including Brooker. And I just decided to go, okay, maybe I'll I'll take a bit more time with this. So I, I I've walked into the house, I've wandered around a bit, closed a couple of doors behind me because it says maybe you should consider closing doors behind you thinking all right okay fine and yeah i'm i'm really struggling to to push myself to to do the next bit which is clearly where i need to do to make the story go further because i think what's scaring me the most is the fact that there's nothing there 
And that's the, that's the beauty of that game now. And I have to admit, like, the first... How long does it take to, to meet the family? 40 minutes? Give or take? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Depends on how much depends on how much of a pussy you are and how much you're looking at everything, I suppose. Yeah, but, I like exploring, so it's probably going to take me a bit longer. Well, I mean, it's a, we'll call it 40 minutes. By the end of that first 40 minutes, by the time I'm sat down with the family and the bit that everybody that's even seen a promotional image of this game, it's that bit. We're all sat at the dinner table with the bakers. My nerves were shredded. I, <laughs> I was an absolute wreck. I was like, nope, I'm turning this off. I'm going to go have a cup of coffee, maybe get some fresh air and find some daylight, because no, just no. <laughs> yeah, I've seen a lot of people talk about the scare factor on the internet, and I think it is a slight barrier to entry, but it was what makes it so brilliant, and anyone who's played Silent Hill will, will probably hear the same thing said about that series. And I forgot what I was going to say now, I've lost my train of thought. <laughs> That's yeah, right, we I'm rarely not. have a train of thought on here, mate, it's alright. <laughs> yeah, it's the, gone. I think yeah. What I found really interesting was, obviously it, I, I got it on release day, but I think I played it for an hour on release day, and then work happened and films and things happened so I didn't play it for a bit and of course in that time everybody's got their hands on it and gone oh it's alright because after the first two or three hours it's not scary anymore and I think it lulled me into a bit of a false sense of security because there is a there is a point you think you've seen everything the game has got to show you and you're you do, you, you walk around and you're like, I'm alright, don't you worry about this, I've I've got this, we're alright, and then you leg it around a corner and something fucking falls out the ceiling at you, and nope, back to square one, shit in a brick, you know, needing nappies, and there's one bit, and I won't spoil it, but there was, there was one bit where you meet one of the members of the family, and you clearly have to get to this certain part of the house where you're not supposed to go, because she's there, but she well, yeah, I spent about 20 minutes avoiding this particular member of the family. And I went, right, I know she's nowhere near where I need to be. I'm going to leave her there and run. Went to go where I was supposed to be, and she fucking jumped out of the shadows at me. Said, nope, absolutely not. The, the wife was watching me at the time. I dropped my controller. I shat myself. I jumped a foot in the fucking air. Absolutely annihilated me. By this point, I thought I was okay. I thought I'd gotten used to the scares and the atmosphere. No, that game does not fucking let up, and I really was expecting it to. It's very, very intense, like exhaustingly intense. I found the first two or three hours of the game to be almost a chore, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way, but it's just like it was so much hard work because it's bombarding you from the first minute with all these intense moments and absolute craziness and I know exactly which bit you were talking about there Brooker and yeah, that, yeah. that's intense there's that a lot of I, stuff going on in that area of the game and, and to add a her on top of it just makes it even worse I literally I threw um, my controller I absolutely I jumped out of my skin oh, it fucking scared the shit out of me yeah well I, I played through it twice I've just finished it for the second time again today and I thought I've played it now it's not going to be anywhere near as scary the second time and you know, it's not as scary the second time around, but the, you, there were bits that I forgot that were going to happen that it would have been yeah. wise of me to have written down and prepared myself because <laughs> <laughs> I still scream like a little girl when they happen. And I think if, if you're one of these types who plays through games multiple times or you like to do speed runs and really challenge yourself, you'll, you'll see ways and means to navigate through the game where you can sort of cut down on some of the altercations that you have with the various enemies you go through the game. Yeah. I mean, it is survival horror. It's not like the later Resident Evil games where you kind of expect it to splatter everything. You kind of don't have to, and in some cases it pays to not kill everything that you come up against. Um, yeah, it took me a couple of a couple of times to realise that certain things you're not supposed to be spending time fighting. And it, it's not until you, you suddenly realise, oh, fuck, I'm all out of ammo. Oh, yeah. shit. That, that's another thing about this game is that compared to early Resident Evil games in particular um, zombies were fodder your yeah. basic enemy in this, the moulded could really kill you quite easily if you're careless Yeah. Uh, so every enemy you come across is a massive threat and you have to make a, a very quick educated choice 
or calculation on the fly whether you need to engage this enemy or just bypass them completely. Yeah. Because every encounter can result in in death in very quick and spectacular fashion, which again adds to the nerve wracking factor of the game amplified enormously. Um, so yeah, uh, it achieves everything I wanted it to and more. I'm at the kind of stage in my life now as a gamer where I don't feel the need to play through games more than once. I've already played through this twice in a week. I'm going to carry on playing through because I know I haven't seen everything. I've not collected everything. There's multiple endings. There's loads of cool achievements. There's DLC coming and I can't wait to play it. Yeah. Um, this is probably going to go down in my top 10 of all time. Where it sits amongst that 10, I don't know yet. It all depends on how Capcom carry it as far as the season goes, as, as it likes yeah. to be referred to these days. but Well, they, they have, they have it. Capcommed it, though, haven't they? I mean, we've had DLC come out for it today, which, you know, a week after release, it's, they've done story DLC, which is great if you want to play more story, but also it's only been a week. Mm. You see, I don't mind that because I think there's enough content in the game to justify having additional DLC. It's not like this is already in the game and we're just hiding it behind a paywall. Oh, absolutely. The it just, it seems huge. really quick to me. That's my only problem with it. I don't mind that. I think it's, it's, if anything, it's clever marketing because I don't know if you watch something like Twitch as an example. Yeah. But when a, when a new game like this comes out, it flies to the top of the Twitch rankings, which helps to promote the game enormously and, and yeah. generate hype. And then after a week, if it's not one of the massive PC online games, it kind of drops out of the top 10 and into obscurity, which has happened with this but now the DLC is like, it's going to be straight back up there again and yeah. I think that's really clever especially for console games because it is mostly dominated by PC games and every new game that comes out wants to be in that Twitch top 10 it needs people to, to see it and talk about it and deliver hype so people go out and buy the DLCs and buy the game and all that good stuff so I've got no problem with it if it was, wasn't a great game if it wasn't a big enough game I would be calling bullshit on yeah. releasing a DLC after one week Personally, I just wish it was coming out on Xbox One today like it has done on PS4 because I'm ready to dip back into <laughs> it big time. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely I want to play it again. I, I I only rented it this time around because I wasn't sure. You know, as good as it looked, I, I genuinely wasn't sure. So I wanted to play it before I bought it. I will definitely be buying it. I will definitely be buying it in some form of complete edition gold edition game of the year edition whatever they want to call it and I know I've said this before it will absolutely wait until I get my PSVR I want to play that in VR I, oh, I can't imagine how scary this game I is I doubt I will reality. ever finish it in virtual reality because it you know it, it, it did it made me yelp on more than one occasion just playing it on my fucking TV playing it in VR is going to be absolutely horrifying but I want to try it <laughs> I know I wouldn't be able to do that. I think my, my dick would shrivel up to an all-time small if I played it in VR, to be honest. Yeah. It would be uh, very embarrassing. Yeah, I, I I, mean, I know full well, and I've, I've said this in the past about horror games, is that I'm, I love a horror games, so horror films. Sorry, is that I absolutely adore them, and I do. But I also, they scare the shit out of me all the time. I'm, you know, I'm not like the target audience for shitty teen horror but I am the target audience for what I would class as a standard horror film because they make me jump you know the atmosphere always gets me you know they shred my nerves every time that's why I love watching them and Resident Evil 7 done the same thing I'm, I desperately desperately want to try it in VR I, I can't imagine just how fucking scary that's going to be uh, you're you're a braver man than me, mate. Uh, I've seen things in that game I don't need to see in virtual reality. That, that's for sure. This is true. I, I do want to mention as well. Actually, is you say that is that the atmosphere in that game is so well put together. When you're so busy trying not to be scared, and you're so busy trying to figure out when the next jump's going to happen, when you dig in and spend a bit of time with the story. When you get towards the end and the penny drops, it was literally it was like you know when you find out who Kaiser Soze is in Usual Suspects. When you when you figure out who or what is going on, you go, mm -hmm. 
Holy shit, how did I fucking miss that? Yeah, that's that's very true. And when you play back through it the second time, you start to see things that don't make any sense until you've played through the whole thing. So it's like, it was all right in front of me, Yeah, but, but I couldn't put it all together. Now I've played through it, and the truth is littered everywhere. Yeah. And you feel a little bit stupid as a result. <laughs> and one thing that I was concerned about is, I really like this game. But I don't see how it connects to the old games. Uh, is, it, is it? Is this just a one-off in America in Swampland? And then, but by the time you finish it, it ties it very nicely in a little bow, not too convoluted. Just a nice little circumstantial link to the old games. That that's fine. That'll do. That's yeah, it needed. was. It was interesting because you can see it as a standalone game easily as well. I like really easily see it as a standalone game. And I think it's been designed that way again, like we were saying about, like when John came to to Resident Evil through Resident Evil Four, which is a good jumping-off point. This I think has the same thing. It's a good standalone game, all on its own. It's a great, but if you're a fan and you're one of those assholes like me and probably like you that goes through and reads all of the files, all of the little things they can find, there's plenty of tie-ins to the series kicking around. Not all of the files you read will be tie-ins to what you, you know to, to the to the Resident Evil games, but there are a few, and obviously I won't spoil it on the podcast. But there are, I read at least one file that timelines it nicely, and I was quite happy when I got to the end. And I'm like, oh, okay, and then obviously the end happens. And again, I won't spoil it, but the end happens. You go, okay, yeah, I'm okay. I'm okay with how that how that ended up like that. It it ties itself in beautifully to the rest of the series. But yeah, as a standalone game, absolutely outstanding. Yeah, it's good that you don't need to have played a single Resident Evil game to enjoy this one. None of the plot is weakened by not playing any of them, and you'll just get a little bit of gratification towards the end if you have played other ones, which is exactly how I felt. It's like, okay, that that links my old experiences to the new one. That's all I need. I'm happy with that. The game was great. And so I had no complaints in the end. I think if I were to try and nitpick the game a little bit, there are a few bits, and maybe this was just me. You can let me know how you feel about this, Brooker. I felt there were certain parts I died on way too much. So I had to replay certain boss battles a fair few times, and that got really annoying. And there were some parts of like puzzle finding and solving and, and certain parts of the game where I felt I was wandering around absolutely clueless. I had to stumble upon answers sometimes. And maybe I was just too busy being scared. And I definitely know that was the fact towards the beginning. There were some things that were blatantly obvious staring me in the face that I couldn't formulate because I was too busy crapping myself. Yeah. Um, And so things took a lot longer than they should have done to proceed. That improved the second time around because I was less scared and I understood more about what I was supposed to be doing. So the game went from a 9 hour 50, which was the first one I did, to just over 6 hours the second time. And I could have done that a lot quicker if I'd played a bit better in some of the boss battles. But um, some people were able to finish this game incredibly quickly. So it is all about how serious do you want to take your gaming? Do you want to play the experience, which is be scared, check every room thoroughly for items, manage your stuff accordingly, kill every monster? Yeah. Or do you just want to, like, right, I'm going to walk past this enemy... I'm not going to collect stuff I don't need. I'm just going <laughs> to bish bash bosh and get it over and done with. Yeah. And I think you'll lose a lot by doing that, but if that's what you play, then that's fine. But um, as a game, great. As an experience, incredible. Um, whenever Konami get their act together, if they do a Silent Hill or whatever Hideo Kojima is going to do with Death Stranding, they've, they've got a real big contender to beat all of a sudden, which for me pretty much came out of nowhere because after... Seeing what 5 and 6 were like, I had no expectations for Resident Evil 7, but I am in love with the game. I think it's incredible. Yeah, I think that's it's a real shame for, for Konami and, and PT and Silent Hills. and However you want to look at it, is that they could have had something... They could have had this quite easily. Did you play they PT? Might have, no, I didn't, because uh, I wasn't a, a PlayStation owner of any kind at the time. Oh, okay. I never had the pleasure. I've seen the footage, and my God, it looked creepy. PT is easily the scariest hour of my life. Yeah, it doesn't look a, a terrible amount different from this. You can really see Capcom have taken everything that was in PT and 
reimagined it to fit their brand of, of what survival horror is. And I'm sure if PT had come around and people had liked it, the same people would like Resident Evil 7 and vice versa. Yeah. Uh, they're in the same sort of universe. Uh, it's just a shame we'll never get to see what that original vision uh, was. But um, yeah, the the horror genre or survival horror, whatever you want to call it, is is definitely hit a new stratosphere now. And uh, I can't wait to see what other games of this type pop up in the next gaming generation or two. It's going to be very exciting indeed. I mean, if you like this, I would definitely recommend games like Outlast, if you haven't played Outlast. That has a lot of the, a lot of the similar elements to this. It's a lot of in the dark. It's a yeah, lot I, don't, of the, I don't think I can play too many um, too many scary games like The Evil Within and, and stuff like that. I'm like Jesus Christ. So The Evil Within, like, I didn't find scary. I just thought, oh shit, <laughs> I never finished it. Uh, but yeah. The Evil Within, actually, I because it was made by the guy that done, that created Resident Evil. And, exactly. And but, it was, but that that's like balls to the wall super X-rated shit and it's like I can't be dealing with that it's just it's too much <laughs> yeah see I mean I don't, I don't think I'd ever recommend Evil Within I would recommend Outlast because it's creepy and atmospheric and yeah I watch friends of mine playing it on Twitch and just listening to them shit their pants at every turn I'd done the same thing when I played I crap my load every single time but mm. I would definitely you know if you're into if you really if you enjoyed RE7 I would say give that a go it's not as good as Resident Evil 7, but it is very good. But yeah, I I really easily in my top five of the year, and I know we're only in Jack we're still only in January. As, you know, Have there even record. been five games released yet this year? <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I, I can go beyond 2017 and, and know that this is probably my favourite game of this generation so far. Uh, I probably not for it's, it's again it's for this generation top five, maybe top ten. I haven't put that much thought into it. I don't, I'm not that deep. <laughs> yeah, it's just genuinely that impressive uh, to me. And, uh, and it is it's it one of those games that, and... because it comes out. No, it doesn't come out of nowhere. That, that's a bit disingenuous. But it, it 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 surprised me on almost every level at how good it was. You know, and how you know, like we said, or like I said with Resident Evil 1 that this thing has its you know the best character in this game is the house that it's set in because it's so beautifully put together and so creepy and yeah it's and I felt it's one of those games and I've done this on a couple of horror games in the past is you find yourself yelling at inanimate objects just so you feel a bit better <laughs> you know just just to like just to let the scare out a little bit of fuck you grandma fucking staring at me fuck you that shit all the yeah, way through the game it's good to hear a familiar and safe voice as well when there's so much rickety creaking and <laughs> stomping around going in other rooms and you're just like the house is alive in this game yeah for lack of a better term um, and that's been the case in a lot of like Resident Evil games particularly the first one um, but it, it's so animated and I don't mean like literally the house is moving, no. but it's 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 almost breathing. It's floorboards are creaking, and it's not just ones that you're walking over. You can feel the whole house is rotting and shrinking yep. down, and you can hear people moving around and having conversations in the rooms next to you and stuff. And it's just like Jesus Christ, it's so tense. Yeah. Oh, and then <laughs> the amount of like there's a, there's a tiny element of stealth in there. You know, there is a bit of having to hide. From, from characters as they, they stalk you around and that adds an enormous amount of tension and maybe even a little bit of frustration. But uh, yeah, it ticks all the boxes for me and it's going to be one of the first games in many years that I'm going to replay multiple times, I think. Yeah, oh for sure. It, it It's definitely one that deserves to be in the collection. And yeah. I'm a little sad I don't own it, but I will. I, I just wait for it to come down in price because it's not a cheap game. I bought the Steelbook one for like 55 quid. Which I kind of thought, of, oh God, if you don't like this, you're going to feel like a bit of a knob. Yeah. But, uh, well, this is the problem, you see, I've done that far too many times. I've gone, oh, I'm not fucking doing that for a game I'm not sure about. Yeah, but I'm glad I did now, so yeah. all was good. But uh, John, you're you're busy carrying away in the corner there. Are you going to actually finish this one? Um, I'm currently at the point of 
I'm too scared to continue and I'm not drawn into the story enough yet to continue so this could take me a very long time to, to play through but I'm I'm currently contemplating whether or not it's worth me just trying to find someone who's playing it on Twitch and just to watch them do that. I mean, I know yeah, a guy that's... who's put up YouTube videos of his entire playthrough, and you don't get the same. Yeah, I think you don't get the same feeling watching it as you do playing no. it. Obviously, but no, I, th I think I'm okay with watching it, playing it. I may may struggle. It the, the good thing about it is it's not like early Resident Evils where you have to keep going until you find a save room it yeah. does have auto save points so literally if you need to go for 20 minutes and stop you can and that's definitely a, a plus mm. I say that but when you complete it on normal difficulty which is hard enough yeah, you can unlock the madhouse difficulty yeah I, you, I didn't you, even consider yeah. trying that I tried, it's very difficult you get less ammunition, all the bosses are more powerful and have more health and you're restricted in, in saving so back returns the old ink ribbon save system that you use yeah. actual physical cassette tapes now so you can't do unlimited saves and it does less of those auto saves before boss battles as well so basically you're going to die uh, way too often and have to start a bit further away from your immediate sense of progress and where you left off before you actually died but uh I think that's the big challenge now for people online. They can complete the game in a couple of hours by by streaming through it very quickly and avoiding things they don't need to do. But can they do it in Madhouse? And I think that's a, a legitimate challenge and probably a bit too difficult for me because I die far too much in normal difficulty as it is, to be honest. Yeah, I died a few too many times, especially in the uh, the first, I think, yeah, the first boss battle, mainly because I didn't realise what I had to do annoyed me yes and then the second mm -hmm. I then the second I realised what I had to do was that well, this was easy yeah it's a little bit of trial and error and once you figure it out things can be very simple but those first time experiences and a, a little sense of helplessness and not an immediate obvious solution can make you feel a little bit stupid and vulnerable yeah. <laughs> at times but that, that's the beauty and of the game it's what makes it frustrating as well I think that's the problem not I, not that I had but I I can imagine it being frustrating for a lot of people if you can't figure out, you know, run, oh, I got run to the left and grab this quickly before the fight starts. Yeah, I got very wound up with it in, in places, but I'm glad to say that the reward for persistence is, is fantastic. Yeah. So all the minor negative emotions I felt when I first started playing it were, were very swiftly washed away. And uh, yeah, it, it ranks very, very highly for me. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Resident Evil Seven. Ev I think it's a game that everybody should play. It's not a game that everybody will be able to play, and that's that's a shame. But yeah, obviously, no, you know, not not everyone can play everything. That would be oh. and definitely not one for your kids. And I don't mean that like Grand Theft Auto has got swear words in it, so you, kids can play it. They just can't go to the shop and buy it. This game is not intended yeah. for children in any way. Shape no. or form. I wouldn't let anyone under fifteen go near this game. No, it is way too scary and way too graphic. No, absolutely. Like there are games that I play, you know, occasionally. Like my little little walk in. She's only three. You know, like, okay, well, I'll just get to this bit and stop. You know, it's not a problem if she sees this. It that's a problem on Resident Evil. It's an instant. She's in the room. Just no. Just get the fucking thing off the telly straight away. Because I can't fucking handle what's going on on that screen. She should not be seeing that. No, you're dead right. Not one for kids in the slightest. 100%. So do we reckon we'll get another one? A, 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 an eight? Uh, Yeah. Where they go with it, though, is going to be quite interesting because we can't really discuss where, where it's leaning towards with the ending. No. no but it seems not. to set up more of the DLC rather than an immediate sequel. Yeah. But... Uh, the reviews are universally fantastic. Public opinion is very high. And this style of game is obviously very popular now with the reception of the PT demo and now this and some similar other games that you've mentioned. Yeah. People want games of this style, these mature gaming experiences. And uh, yeah, I'm sure Capcom have got a money spinner on their hands, providing they don't let the story get out of control. 
and they don't get too lofty with their aspirations. I mean, part of the reason why we, we, we have this negative slant on Resident Evil 6, it's obviously not a terrible game, but it was probably too ambitious in its scope. It was trying to do too much. Yeah. Where all it needed to focus on is being a scary stroke action orientated game. This has gone back to 100% horror with a, a smidgen of action. And it's the best Resident Evil game since the original two, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, if they stick with that, then this can go back to being one of the pr- premier uh, gaming franchises once again. No, I think I, I think I agree with you, hundred percent. Yeah, definitely looking forward to what they do more. For me, uh, I hope it brings a few more high quality horror games, not necessarily, you know first person spooky things set in Louisiana any horror games just a good quality one we mentioned Prey earlier that looks quite scary I'm, I, I hope this brings out a, 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 a few I don't want lots because you know then, then we're, we're talking like what happened with first person shooters when Modern Warfare was suddenly the greatest thing ever made and we just overrun with them but I'll take you know three or four good quality horror games over the next couple of years I'd be a happy man. I can only hope. Mm. Um, another thing, just before we sort of wrap things up on that one, is that it's very unusual for a Japanese game developer to embrace the first-person view in a, in a triple-A video game. Um, generally not very popular in Japan, this type of game. Um, I imagine this will be very popular. And so we've had... The industry in general has been smothered with great first person games developed mostly by European and American games developers and Japan have gone nowhere near it for the most part I'm sure there are exceptions but generally speaking it's not a a style that they embrace if this is as popular over there as it is over here what will Capcom and then subsequently other Japanese game developers do with the first person view and we're going to see a wave of very innovative and unique first person view games not necessarily shooters but from the first person perspective yeah that, that we've never seen before and I think that's very exciting because modern gaming particularly with the style of controllers that we use today are all geared for first person view games yet the Japanese who are traditionally the best at making great video game experiences don't embrace it maybe now they will and maybe they'll show people like id and Bethesda and Activision and Infinity Ward and all those people how to do great games in the first person view yeah. in a way that we've never seen before because just changing the view on Resident Evil 7 has made it infinitely more scary and they've done it really really well so if they continue that trend the possibilities are endless and I'm really keen to see what they do with it yeah I, I, I agree with you completely I can't, I can't wait to see what they do with once it becomes popular and they realise that there's there's money to be made and there's that it would be like it has been with Resident Evil it's literally a whole new perspective for their games so yeah a couple of years time to see hopefully we get a few few new experiences ja- Japanese games tend to not hit my radar very often not that I don't like them they just tend to make the kind of games that I don't play you know I don't actively avoid them they just tend to be you know unless you know we're talking Capcom stuff well, Street Fighter and, and Resident Evil is about where it stops. Devil May Cry, back in the day, I was a big fan, but Marvel you won't. Capcom. Well, yeah. <laughs> counts. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, of course it counts. But yeah, it, it's, you know, Japanese games have never really resonated with me very well, so I, I look forward to maybe playing more when they they do something geared more towards audiences over on this side of the globe. I think, uh, have we got anything else to say on Resi? Uh, I'm sitting here probably scared enough now that I won't ever travel to Louisiana. (laughs) Yeah, too right. (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah, if you get a video message of someone who's been missing for three years, don't, don't try and find them. Yeah. Just, just, just ignore it. Put it in the, in the bin. Delete it. Yeah. When they say don't come to get me, just take their advice. Stay at home. Play video games. So yeah, before we wrap up for the day, I think that for the night, that leaves us just with some recommendations, lads. Uh, Matt, have you got a recommendation for for guys that listen or the people that are listening? 
Yeah, um, what I would like people to, to go and check out and support if possible. It's not a freebie, but it's a very low-cost Steam game. And the game's called Gunman Taco Truck, and this is an independent game um, primarily programmed by the 12-year-old son of John Romero, who, of course, is the legend behind games like Doom, Doom 2, Quake, etc., one of the founding members of its software. And now works for so, Oculus. Uh, yeah, now works for them. <laughs> and uh, John Romero Jr. has come up with a novel little side-scrolling sort of shooty game that kind of looks something in the vein of a Pants vs. Zombies type affair, but it looks really cool. And for a 12 year old, an astonishing achievement. So check it out. Maybe watch it on uh, Twitch or YouTube, see if you like it. And then if you do, perhaps go and support it on Steam. But yeah, it looks very interesting. And we might have a star in the making with that one. It looks very interesting indeed. Cool. Mr. Miller? All right. I'm going with something that is uh, free for a very limited amount of time, as in from Thursday. So actually, when you're listening to this, if you're listening to it on release day yesterday, uh, Rainbow Six Siege is free to play this weekend. Cool. Cool. Nice. I might even try and find time to play it myself. Slightly less scary than Resident Evil 7. <laughs> Just ever so slightly, yeah. Yep. Uh, I think I'll actually, I'll probably go in the the same vein as Matt's recommendation. I It is, currently it is free. But I get the feeling that by the time the podcast goes up, it won't be free, but it is possible to buy it for about two pounds from GOG. And I'm talking about the original Constructor. Have you guys come across Constructor? No, it doesn't really no, it doesn't. Oh, so You guys must, must, must look up Constructor. It's basically like playing SimCity with the mob. It's really very cool. Uh, but the guys are currently rebuilding Constructor into an HD remake, and I believe it's coming out on PC and consoles including the Switch, which is interesting. But they're obviously they're funding themselves with selling the, the old copy of their game. I would absolutely, it's like a pound 50 on GOG. You you won't spend a better pound 50 for, even if you only play it for half an hour and just go, nah, it's not for me. For a pound 50, it's absolutely worth it. I'd, I'd do that. But yeah, at the moment, at least while I talk, it's free on GOG if you have a code off of the Constructor Facebook page. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> that sounds like a good suggestion good way to spend a couple of quid I'm currently yeah, watching it, videos on Gunman Taco Truck it, it does look good doesn't it can't believe a fucking 12 year old made that but yeah and that's that I think is is us uh, as we wrap up Matt do you want to do your plugs do you want to do some plugs let us know where people can find you yeah um, I'll be on uh, Fail Critics from time to time so you might hear my voice occasionally on this uh, podcast feed other than that I you were on this week appear, weren't you? I was on this week talking about Train Spotting 2 which was pretty cool uh, first time I've been on for a while but it was nice to, to reconnect with the boys um, you can also find me at the RGDS podcast from time to time uh, and if you want some recommended listening for podcast and YouTube and if you're into PC gaming, particularly old school PC gaming I'd recommend you check out the Big Box PC Game Collectors podcast, it's a bit of a mouthful um, but very insightful about sort of 80s and 90s uh, MS, DOS and Windows games, very interesting stuff and they get some good interviews with industry figureheads including people like John Romero who we spoke about earlier so do check them out, they're very good Cool and uh, John, for the next couple of weeks before we do our next episode, where can people find you, mate? As ever, you can find me at Twitter at, as at the John underscore CU and on Xbox Live with Long Dong Silver. Cool. I am at Brook411 on Twitter if you want to see me rant and rave about films and games and pretty much anything that pisses me off at the time. I also i am on the Foul Critics podcast a fair amount. I think in the next five weeks I'm on four times I don't know yeah, so you've got your work cut out for you then eh? I have a little bit so, um, I think Couldn't John and I better. actually John and I are on next week talking about mm-hmm. Resident Evil oh god you're going to have enough of that subject matter aren't you yeah uh, at least it's going to be the shitty films this time and not the really good game yeah I really like the films which is yeah. weird considering I well I suppose I really like the action game so the action films really make sense yeah, I don't have hold out high hopes for the latest film. That's that's for next week. And yeah, I'm on 
then I'm on uh, the, the Oscar the Oscar pods uh, one week after another the predictions and the awards and then I'm on the week after that talking about Logan so yeah I'm I'm a busy boy uh, so yeah you can always find me on Foul Critics I, I, I'm writing for Foul Critics and if all else fails you can find us at Character Unlock on Facebook and at Character Unlock on Twitter and that just leaves me to say thank you very much for coming on Matt it's been an absolute pleasure having you on no my pleasure anytime boys it's been a long time since you and me have been on a podcast together so it's it's, it's been very cool to sit and chat a little bit of bollocks for a couple of hours it's been lovely it has mate and yeah a very good subject matter to reconnect on but uh, anytime you need someone to, to talk some shit on the podcast give me a call or talk more shit because me and John do yeah. do plenty yeah. all on our own <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah that leaves us just to say goodnight if you were you join us again in a couple of weeks I don't, I don't even know what we're doing in a couple of weeks I don't even know what's out probably something John will be talking about Mass Effect almost certainly yep. and I will be taking the piss out of John for talking about Mass Effect so if that's what you want to hear come join us in a couple of weeks and as always guys thank you very much for listening Thank you.